I was driving down the street in Bunbury. There was nothing in my car but me. I had on me my mobile phone. No notes, no anything. And I was going to visit a kindergarten child. They hadn't started with me yet. They were going to start the following year. And I'd made the arrangement with the parent, which had felt a bit like inviting myself for dinner. And I said, I'm coming to you for half an hour. And I wasn't sure how it was going to go. I'd sent a little letter to confirm it, just in case they forgot. And a red, letter, a red balloon for the child to put on their letterbox so that they knew I was coming. Well, the red balloon turned out to be a really good idea. But as I was turning the corner for this place, I was really nervous. I hadn't done very many, and it was a pretty bold move for me. But when I came to the driveway, there was this letterbox. And I'm not kidding, the, the, the ribbon was about this wide, and the entire letterbox was completely enveloped in this red bow. And I, I just smiled, and I, I, I stopped the car. This little boy tumbled out of the house shrieking, Dad, Dad, she's here, she's here. And my heart just filled, and I thought, this is going to be OK, this is going to work. Now, the reason I was doing this was because some time before, my principal had come to me and he'd read some research from Dr Fiona Stanley and he was very keen to make some connections with families of children before they started school in the kind of zero to four age bracket. All the brain research had been really been coming out in its full and we thought, oh, what could I think of? There was a grant up for grants if I could think, think of a good idea. Now, I went back in my mind when I sat and reflected to my early years as a community preschool teacher. Now, in those days, the community preschool was quite separate from the education department. I was paid by them, but the community preschool was owned by the community. Everything in it was owned by the community. And when I, as a new teacher, arrived, the parents put the barbecue on for me, and they welcomed me. It was their place. And here I am now in a pre-primary, in a kindergarten, and it's the department's place. Something had seriously changed. So I was trying to work out how I could overcome this. And Thinking to simple terms, I thought, well, how about if I go to visit them and they come to visit me? Which is essentially what we do when we meet somebody new in our community. We say, hey, come over to our place or we'll meet you for coffee somewhere. So that was my basic premise. And this program became called the Linking Education and Families Program. I actually can't remember what it was called when I started. These things kind of develop as they go. But in my school for one year, I set up what we called a play cafe. So on a Thursday morning, and it's still happening now, the parents of zero to four-year-olds from anywhere in Bunbury, it's not specific to our school, can come in, spend an hour and a half in the kindergarten, visit with the teacher, and also meet the community child nurse, because a child health nurse is the most amazing partner to have. And I, as a teacher, I decided that I would need to step out into the community to find them. So this program was developed on, in the basis of partnerships that happened, as I kind of, it happened gradually, and one of my big problems when I started was I actually didn't know what I didn't know. So I didn't even know what questions to ask. So I basically asked everyone I knew in the community, and that included speech pathologists, child health nurses, anyone I could think of that worked with small children, do you think it's a good idea if I do this? And they all said, this is great. And some of them came on board and became people who are now my friends, and some of them became encouragers, and some of them are people who are professional allies. But what happened was I gradually developed these partnerships in the community. I did training in the Family Partnership Program, which taught me how to listen. I learned all sorts of words that I'd never heard of, like even the phrase that's basic in social science, do no harm. As an educator, I hadn't heard. I hadn't heard of asset development and human capital and Brofenbrenner and all sorts of things. But I did hear about how much everybody in the community was passionately concerned with the zero to four-year-olds. Now, this program started out within my school, just me in my school working with the parents, and I'd visit all of the kindergarten children, which in Western Australia is 40 children. They come in two lots of sessions. So it was quite a lot of visits to do. And then as time progressed, I was asked if I could train three other teachers. Now this was a bit of a challenge. I was trained as an early childhood teacher, but they, the department had released some money because they, so they could do play cafes, home visiting, and take this program on. So gradually, I had to write up what I was doing. And it's much easier when you're doing something than it is to actually pass it on. You have to really stop and think. So I had to stop and think. And one of the things that I was trying to pass on to these teachers was a compass, like the direction. What is the essence of this program? And one of the big parts that I wanted to pass on was partnership. And one of the analogies I used was, if you imagine that we're all on an ocean, for the purpose of this, it's a flat one, that it can be in anything. And in this, in this ocean, there are some giant liners, huge, huge liners. They're called the Department of Education, the Department of Health. All these amazingly enormous bodies that 
guide and influence and had a lot of say in our lives, particularly when you're a parent of young children. And they're pretty big. And they've got these family boats around in varying stages of some are amazingly well off, some are really in a state of disrepair, some are nearly sinking. And it's very difficult to get any communication between them because, as you know, very big ships take a long, long time to turn around. But as a teacher, I could climb into a small craft, which is basically what my program was. It was a small craft to get alongside these parents and say, hey, I'm with you for a year. I might have some charts, I might have some maps, I might know some people that are useful for you. Do you mind if I come alongside? It wasn't about taking over control of their boat. It was their boat. It was their crew. And one of the other snags that I had was some of them could see me as a, would, would perceive me as a pilot. They've had experiences in their past, and this is their children. They're very precious children, particularly if it's your oldest child, the first one out. But you've had some bad experiences, and I had to somehow develop a relationship with them so they understood that I wasn't a pirate, I was actually an ally. I could even be better than that, I could be a partner. I could recognise them as equal people that I knew something, but they knew a whole lot more about their child. So this analogy was the analogy I used for partnership. Another thing that we had to learn in the process was about listening. Listening, as you know, if you've ever tried to listen actively, it's very hard work because you have to put down who you are, what you think, and just hear the experience of the person. And when I was doing these home visits, that was my purpose for being there for 30 minutes. I didn't take papers and pen. I didn't take any agenda. I wasn't there to tell them anything about the program, the curriculum, any of that. I was there for half an hour to hear that family's voice, to hear that child's voice. And how it went was how it went. And a good one was when they talked for 25 minutes and I talked for five. I'm an expert on children's bedrooms. I spent a lot of time sitting on the floor in children's bedrooms, playing games, admiring horses, ponies, uh, Great Danes that sat with their head on my lap while I had the visit. I had some uh, extremely funny times at different times. But the privilege for me was I'd get a window and when 40 children come at the beginning of the year, I would have 40 windows in my mind and I never forgot a name after a home visit because they became real. They became real people. The mother, the father, and a lot of times, dad or mum would take time off work for the home visit. Sometimes grandparents would turn up because they say, who is this woman that's coming into your house? I better come and check. And I would, I would find these amazing connections. And to this day, there's children, I meet them, and I think, yeah, I remember, you really like cricket. And you had those chickens. I really used to have those chickens. But somehow it made them really real people to me, which was incredibly helpful. Now, the heart analogy was one I developed for the, for the teachers I was training. The heart was for hearing and for your heart. So if you're really listening to somebody, you're listening with your whole self. One of the kanji symbols in the Japanese alphabet talks about is actually all the symbols are for your hearing, for your eyes, for your heart, so that you're engaged, completely engaged in there. The E was for empathy. And empathy is more than just walking a mile in somebody's shoes. It's something that should override your own personal constructs, your own view of the universe. It's so you actually in, in become part of who they are and hear them. And I learned one of the um, early lessons for me was when I did a home visit and I kind of went in with four-year-olds in my head because that was my, my work, is with the four-year-olds. And the mum did not want to talk about the four-year-old. She was fine. What she wanted to talk about was the 18-year-old who was addicted to ice and was destroying their lives. And it was desperately hard for her and desperately hard for this four-year-old who adored her big brother who was just completely in the process of self-destructing. So that's what our home visit was around. So I needed to get out of my world, which was completely unrelated to hers, and just hear what she was saying. And often that gift of hearing is the only gift we can give people. As a teacher stepping out of my classroom, I wanted to fix everything. I'm a fixer by heart. I want to fix things. But very often we can't. And it's very hard for teachers to take off that hat of I know what I'm doing and go into territory when you haven't a clue, but somebody else might if you need to. The A was part of that, the attitude. So to go out with an attitude of I'm here to hear the families, not to tell them about what our assessment procedures are, not to get them sorted out with how we're going to manage the lunch boxes, but just to have an attitude of respect towards them. And the R, of course, is for respect. And that is something that has to come personally, face to face. Respect is something you earn. So I sow the seeds in that visit and I hope I build on those throughout the year. And it's fascinating how fast, through that respect, through that whole process, and with trust, which being the T, that a process that used to take me about six months would happen in that one visit, in that 30 minute visit. So when the parents came, I felt like I knew them. And I did know them better than lots of other people I thought I knew 
because we'd actually spent half an hour with each other. And that was a very important basis for me. So while the play cafes were also fabulous because families were coming in and I was getting a chance to talk to them, this same process was there. And I'd hear about the birth stories and that people have quite severe traumas in their lives very often and you wouldn't know by their faces. And these traumas affect their children, it affects their lives. And very often the listening ear is the gift that we can give. And of course when parents have concerns, it's good to have a listening ear as well. And the reality, well reality is something that bit me fairly early in the piece because I, I think you start out as kind of a bit like a teenager, you know, very sort of it's all about me. And I very rapidly learned that it wasn't about me at all, it was all about them. And one of my very first home visits, which I now think of humorously, but at the time was a bit stressful, was I pulled up and it was a set of units. And in the garden were six, oh, more than six people, all with blue uniforms on that said forensic police. <laughs> my, my initial reaction was to back out and leave, and I thought that wouldn't be a good look. So I stopped and I got out and I said, look, I'm here for that first unit, I think, and I'm here for a family visit. And they said, not a good day, love. Um, so I just checked that the child was all right and I left. And then I was gripped with this, what about the mum? What about the family? And how embarrassing it must be. You know? And on the next day, I talked to the school psychologist. This was at the very beginning of the program and I was still quite unsure of my role and still in very much in fix-it mode. And I said, what can I do? He said, look, invite her in. I'll come with you. We'll talk to her together. So I rang up the mum and I said, would you mind coming and just talking with me and the school psychologist to see if we can help? She didn't mind at all. And we sat there in the room and I, I just watched him. And he just listened to her. There again, he listened to her story. And at the end he said, well, what can we do? Now she was facing losing a house. She was facing potential um, problems. There were drugs found. And she looked at me full in the eyes and she said, I just want you to treat me like a normal person. I said, I can do that. I can do that. And I learned so much just from that one interaction. That is what everybody wants, is to be treated like a normal person. It doesn't matter what you look like, where you're from, you want to be treated like a normal person. So reality, was, for me, was learning to put down my construction of what was happening, my beliefs on what was good enough parenting, whatever that is, and I still don't know what it is, and I'm not sure how you measure it anyway, and enter their reality. Because that was the reality. The children came to me as students. And they would come to me from whatever their little world was in their house, their own culture. Every house has its own culture. And by these home visits, I had a window. And I could work with them through that reality. The listening has come through it all. But one of the things I learned was to listening to parents. And parents don't often listen to themselves. Well, if you go back to that analogy of the, the, the river, or of the ocean, I should say, there's enormous amounts of information out there. When I started this program, I thought, oh, I don't know, I need to read up about speech, I need to read up about development, I need to read up about brain development. There is amazing amounts of information out there, and it's thrown at parents from all sorts of places, and most of it, to be honest, I think floats away. Because you, you, we deal every day, minute by minute, hour by hour, and most of our good information comes from a useful person face to face. So information wasn't the problem. And I'd often have parents, and I still do, have parents come to me and say, I don't know what to do. And quite often I'll say, put your hand on your stomach. Take a minute. Now tell me what you think you should do. Nine times out of ten, they know. They really do know. They know their child. Whatever the decision is they make, they're going to be living with it. It's very much their boat to steer. And sometimes my role has been just to put them back in the steering wheel and say, it's your boat. I'm here for you. I'm here with you. But it's your boat. And listen to them. And obviously, sometimes, many times, there are other people that can help. And it didn't have to be me all the time. I'm really good now at saying, I've no idea. I'll find out. And that's been very freeing for me. It's freed me completely from that expert model, which is a bit stressful. Possibilities is something that Heather's going to talk about later. And I look forward to that. Because one of, one of the lessons I learned in a home visit was there was a child that I was working with. And I, I knew the older brother, so I knew the family reasonably well. And I did this home visit. It had been wonderful fun, but he didn't speak. He had selective mutism and he wasn't speaking. And they didn't know why at that time. They just knew that since he was about 18 months, his speech had not developed as it should. And everyone was, had been visited and there'd been all sorts of things that they, the parents had been to. And after this visit, I'm sitting at the kitchen table thinking, I have absolutely no great moments of wisdom to hand this parent. But actually, it turned out I did. Because I thought, what would I want if this was me? As a parent, by then I had older children, so I had some chance of reflection. I thought, what do I want? I said, how about on this journey of kindergarten? Let's make it fun. Let's
let's make it about the possibility of who he is. He's not a disability, he's a possibility. So let's work with what he can do. I'll work with him, you'll work with him, and as we find out things that can help him, that's fine. But let's not this journey for you as a parent and me as a teacher be about what he can't do because there's a whole lot more that he can. And I found that a really useful perspective as a teacher when a child comes in with some issues or some sometimes quite confronting behaviour. What are the possibilities? Because they're far more interesting than the disabilities. And the joy. The joy is the dinosaur in the cupboard. I went to the home visit. And I got to the door, the door was flung open, I was grabbed by the hand, dragged through, literally dragged through the house, saying to the parents, is it all right, is it right, that's fine. Through the bedroom, into the cupboard, slammed the door, and I'm standing there in the pitch dark with this child. <laughs> I'm thinking, I could hear the mum giggling. And I'm thinking, okay, what's this about? And then they all started his glow-in-the-dark dark, dark dinosaurs. They were his treasure. He was so proud of his glow-in-the-dark dinosaurs. And it was a moment of absolute sheer joy for me. And there were many visits. I mean, I could talk to you for an hour about home visits. They really are one of the great joys of my life. Now, I'm standing here because I had an idea. And this idea took me out into areas of this community I didn't even know existed. Um, through the funding that I got um, with the help of investing in our youth and the partners from the Department of Health, we ended up with six schools that ran it for two years. And then in the end, it became eight modules that are released through our local principals association. So for me, the bird has kind of flown, that I have had the privilege of seeing it through from the seed to a plant that continues in its own life. And there are play cafes around the state in varying places, and I have no idea where they are, and I don't mind at all, because I think your best idea is you want somebody else to stand on your shoulders and take them somewhere else. But for me, as a teacher, I carry through that sense of equal opportunities is helping people to become equal, to helping families, children, come into my centre and find it a safe place to be. And I'd just like to encourage you, if you've got an idea, there are people out there, you might even not know what the questions are you need to ask to find out where to go, but there are people out there. So pluck up your courage and go out there, because there is a whole world out there. Thank you.